Good morning. Uh, it is good to uh, welcome you here on uh, the Sunday. The Sunday when we uh, think about that Sunday so many years ago, um, when the people gathered in Jerusalem to rejoice in the triumphant king. Um, I've been thinking this week, this past week, about the emotions of the people in Jerusalem. And I thought about how, uh, how excited they were, but yet how incorrect many of their assumptions were. They assumed that the king that rode into Jerusalem would be a, one that would be coming with uh, an earthly power that would throw off the shackles of Rome. And I have, to, I have to ponder and I have to think that their disappointment in what they were thinking of when they were thinking of Jesus was part of what manifested in their anger and their bitterness that uh, was evident when he was crucified. And it makes me think about, in my own life, what my expectations are for Jesus. Makes me ponder, like, what, what do I expect from him in my daily living? We gather together today, and we think about Jesus and his hopeful return, hopefully in our lifetimes, hopefully soon. Because we look about at the yoke of bondage that is on us now from sin, it tears apart families tears apart lives. And we so clearly need Jesus and his return at this time. And so as we think about uh, Jesus and his coming to Jerusalem prior to his, um, his death and his resurrection, uh, the students of the senior high class will, uh, will help us reflect on that further. Uh, thank you to the two generations of kids that uh, helped us this morning. Um, for a hymn, we will hymn, sing out of uh, the purple hymnal, hymn number 17. Um, and one of my earliest memories is singing this hymn, usually the first Sunday of conference. Um, I remember just the, the strength of this hymn um, in the auditorium. And so let us uh, rejoice as we think about our Lord and Savior with hymn number 17 in the purple hymnal. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us, and thank you for the opportunity for us to worship here today. Lord, we know what today is, being Palm Sunday, and we've had a great example of it this morning. And we also know that you gave your life for ours. Lord, please be here with our speaker, Mike, as he brings the message. And Lord, be with each of us that we may have an understanding, and we ask that you continue to have your spirit here with us this morning. In Jesus' most holy name we pray, amen. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time and the service which we can come before you and return a portion of those gifts which we, we have been blessed with. Lord, we also understand that this is not the only time that we can return a portion of these things we've been blessed with our times and our talents and other resources. And I'd ask, Lord, that we look into our lives and find ways and times where we can return unto you those gifts which you have blessed us with. Lord, we thank you so much for this building which you bless us with and this opportunity to come and worship in your name. And these things I pray in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is from 2 Nephi, the first chapter, starting in verse 1, 15. <clears throat> Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. 
And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time, that he might redeem the children of men from the fall. And because that they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon, save it be by the punishment of the Lord at the great and last day, according to the commandments which God hath given. Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man. And they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. And now, my sons, I would that ye should look to the great mediator and hearken unto his great commandments and be faithful unto his words and choose eternal life according to the will of his Holy Spirit. When I grew up in Northwest Ohio, I didn't have any uh, friends or kids my age in the church. I was the only one, and I would go to <clears throat> church camps, retreats, and summer camp, and I remember uh, coming back and having to ride the bus out to high school, which was a good 25-minute drive from where I lived, and singing that, I was singing that song in my head, Paula, uh, just feeling so lonely going back into school and high school where there was, you know, no one to my age to be with and uh, thinking on how lonely Jesus had to be. Uh, I don't know if it brought me comfort, but at least I felt a little camaraderie, although the school bus quite different than the cross. But um, Jeff's opening remarks today uh, was really what we're going to talk about today, and that's the image and the picture of this Jesus and how mysterious it was and how it was looked at differently and how he turned the kingdom of God really uh, upside down um, in so many ways. But uh, I love services where everything's a little kind of different and not, not as, uh, as they always go. Uh, so we'll just keep with that. We're going to watch a little five-minute video. If you're not acquainted with the Bible Project, it's a great ministry, um, and I love it. I, I use it a lot. There's great resources for families and kids, so hopefully the young ones will enjoy this. But it's about a five-minute video about the Son of God. If you read the New Testament, you'll notice that the most common title people use to describe Jesus is the Christ, that is, the Messiah. But surprisingly, Jesus almost never used that word to describe himself. Instead, he called himself the Son of Man. The Son of Man. What does that mean? Well, the phrase comes from an important chapter in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel was an Israelite prisoner of war who was forced to live in the empire of Babylon and work for the prideful, violent king who destroyed his home. That sounds horrible. And while he was living and working in Babylon, Daniel had this crazy prophetic dream. You ready for it? I'm ready. He saw four beasts crawling out of a dark sea, hybrid monster-like animals each scarier than the one before. And the fourth beast is so mutant, there's nothing to compare it to. And it's violent, leaving death and destruction in its wake. What in the world is this about? Well, he's told that these beasts symbolize violent, prideful kings and their empires. Oh, like the one Daniel's enslaved to. Yeah, and these creatures might seem random to you, but these images are developing an important biblical theme. How humans are these remarkable creatures capable of doing great good and horrible evil. How we can behave like animals. Right. Look at the first pages of the Bible. God creates the beasts of the field and humans together, all from the dust. But then the humans are set apart and given a royal task of being God's image. So humans are like the animals, but called to become much more. Yeah, they're to be God's representatives on earth, ruling on his behalf like kings and queens. But keep reading, and the humans are deceived by a beast who says that they could be more than just God's partners. Yeah, that they could rule the world on their own terms, which sounds good to them. But God knows this will be a disaster. And so he expels the humans to the realm of the beasts. The partnership is lost. But God makes a promise that one day a human will be born who won't give in to the beast. Rather, he'll overcome and strike the beast 
while being struck by it. Okay, so for the rest of the biblical story, we're waiting for that human. But instead, in story after story, we find people acting like beasts. Yeah, like in the next story about Cain. He was jealous and angry at his brother Abel. God warns Cain that he's facing a beastly urge called sin, a dark, mysterious kind of evil that consumes humans. But God says that Cain can rule the beast if he chooses. But he doesn't rule the beast. He lets this urge devour him, and he becomes a beast. And then after this, Cain's children spread their animal-like violence, and it leads to the founding of a whole civilization known for its beastly pride, the city of Babylon. Okay, Babylon. So fast forward, this is where Daniel is enslaved, having this bizarro dream. Exactly. Now, watch what happens next in Daniel's dream. He sees into God's throne room where a court is set up, and God condemns the beast to destruction. That's great. And then Daniel sees that there's actually more than one divine throne. Oh, right, the throne that humanity left behind. Right. There hasn't been a human who's able to overcome the beast and rule alongside God until now. Daniel sees a figure called the Son of Man, which means a human. And he rides on a cloud up into God's presence and then sits down on the divine throne to rule the world. The partnership's renewed. Yes, and even more. All humanity worships and serves this son of man alongside God. Oh, worship. So this is no ordinary human. This is like a God human. Exactly. And so now you can see why Jesus of Nazareth, when he came onto the scene centuries later, chose this title, the son of man, for himself. He was claiming to be that truly human one on a mission to confront the beast. He was tempted to seize power on the beast's terms. But unlike every human before him, Jesus resisted the urge. And then he went about banishing the beast from people's lives, and he was teaching people how to rule the beast instead of being ruled by it. Okay, so how do you rule the beast? Well, Jesus did it by giving up his life. Wait, rule the beast by dying? Yes, When Jesus was on trial in a human courtroom and being condemned to death, he said, From this moment on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at God's right hand and coming on the clouds. But this is the moment he's about to die. Exactly. From one perspective, the cross looks like a beastly torture device. But Jesus viewed it as his throne. And on this throne, he exposed the subhuman nature of our evil by letting it do its worst and then he overcame it with his divine life and love. Jesus' execution was his exaltation. So Jesus is the first human to overcome the beast. And as a result, he can partner with God to rule the world. And so now, Jesus is summoning a new humanity into existence, one that can overcome the beast in the same paradoxical way. To rule the beast by dying. And then by discovering that Jesus' life and power can become our life and power. So we can rule the world as God's partners, but Jesus style, in the power of service, humility, and self-giving love. Isn't that great? I love that. Um, You can just Google the Bible Project, families, if you want resources for helping your children to learn the scriptures, uh, help you adults to... They're pretty deep. I get something more out of that every time I watch it. So there's a lot of information there. Um, but since we did that, I just put my notes on here. So we'll maybe use these. It'll be helpful. But I wanted to talk about that that image of Christ and <clears throat> this mystery and the expectations, as Jeff mentioned in his call to worship, that people had um, regarding him and what he was here to do and, and tie that into our lives and make it meaningful today for where we're at. But it says that um, Jesus asked this question to his disciples. It says, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And there he refers to himself as the Son of Man. And they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, for flesh and blood have not revealed this unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And then a little later, he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. I want you to think a little bit. I wonder, I don't 
have the exact answer, but it, I think it allows us to ask the question, why would he not want them to tell uh, people that he was Jesus the Christ? And we're going to talk just in a little bit about what that word Christ means. But he says, from that time forth, he began to show his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And that's our theme for this month. And it seems that even though he began to show them from that time forth that they still didn't get it, as you can see their rejection in their actions after he was crucified and died. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, that this shall not be done unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And that's kind of the theme, I think, through Jesus' life and ministry here, was that people wanted to savor the things of men and have Jesus act in the ways of men that fed their fleshly desires, their, fresh, their fleshly wants and needs to be free from Rome, as Jeff said, and to find freedom that way. But they weren't savoring the things of God and this upside-down kingdom that Jesus was going to talk to them about. So Jesus most often referred to himself as the Son of Man, and as you saw in that video, that literally means the human one, a human. And Daniel, that's allusion to Daniel's vision where he saw this human form ruling up in heaven on the right hand of God. So God was here, but he was in human form. And just a couple of many scriptures that are popular that Jesus would refer to himself the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Uh, I said this that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, that the human one, the human God has power to forgive sins. And why, another time to pause and ask ourselves, why, uh, why is this important that Jesus was trying to show his humanity and, and not referring to himself as the Messiah or Christ, but rather as a human, the human one. And we have a, a prophecy or a, a, an illustration clear back in the very beginning in Genesis. Uh, and we saw that in the video, what happened when Adam and Eve decided to know better than God and, and take upon them their own will instead of God's will. And in Genesis 3, 16, I think this is the inspired version, it says, uh, And I, the Lord God, said unto Adam, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee, that thou shouldest not eat? If so, thou shouldest surely die. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest me, and commanded that she should remain with me, she gave me of the fruit of the tree, and I did eat. And I, the Lord, said unto the woman, What is this thing which you... Thou hast done. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And I, the Lord God, said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou shalt be cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And Jesus fulfilled this in the ultimate way, as he was the human one, and he was part of the seed of Adam. That he was the final one, that he was bitten by the serpent in the heel, and it killed him. But he also bruised the head of the serpent and killed it, so to speak that it would have no power over mankind anymore. And so people most often referred to Jesus as Christ or Messiah, which both of these words mean the same thing in Hebrew, one's in Greek, but they mean the anointed one, or, or in the most literal sense, one smeared with oil, the anointed one. There's, I know there's at least one version of the Bible, I think it's the, the voice that, uses this term instead of Messiah for whenever Christ is referred to. But in that culture, 
there was two uh, main ways that people were smeared with oil or anointed, and that was if they were a high priest or if they were uh, going to be a king and become a king. And so by these words, Messiah and Christ, the anointed one, being used by the people at that time, it gives us a picture into what they were expecting. They were expecting this king that had been prophesied of that was going to come and, and take his throne and relieve them of the, of the pressure of, of being occupied by the Romans in that way of life. The Book of Mormon, I really like, adds even more clarity to this word Messiah as it, it adds in this definition. It says literally the Messiah, or in other words, the Savior of the world, the Redeemer of the world. And that word Redeemer, it's interesting, isn't found anywhere in the New Testament. It's throughout the Old Testament, but it is found in the Book of Mormon in relating it to Christ on a number of places. And so this mystery of this human, this man that came but was also the son of God brought this upside down uh, kingdom. And he started doing things in a way that was contrary to uh, a king taking his place on the throne. And a lot of people, that caused a lot of confusion and mystery, even among his, his closest uh, followers. You know, they wanted to be delivered from Rome, and he was teaching them that there's a, a greater deliverance, a greater freedom than not being occupied by another nation, but the freedom to love one another, the freedom to uh, not be controlled by your emotions and anger, the freedom to, to know God in a way that they never had before. He taught them to love their enemies and, and to submit to authority. And as that video pointed out, he took his throne, but not as they thought, but the cross became his throne. And he was exalted as he was lifted up on that cross to die. A completely, I think, foreign concept that we can't get because we look backwards on the whole thing with all of the scriptures we have. But at that time, as Jeff said, try to imagine how can this man who's now being killed in front of us in a most cruel way, how does that draw all men unto him? As he said, I will be lifted up and draw all men unto me. And so our theme for this, for this month has been the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected and killed and after three days rise again. How many of you have seen this picture before. Oh, yeah. This is the most uh, replicated picture of Jesus in the world. This has been replicated over a half a billion times between photos and calendars and coffee mugs and mouse pads. Half a billion times. <clears throat> That's probably similar to the Jesus I imagine in my head as I've prayed from a little boy. I don't, do you, when you pray, when you say in your prayers, do you picture a God or Jesus? How many picture some sort of Jesus when they're praying? Or is it just some space you're talking to you? Yeah, he, I, I have a picture in my mind, but maybe that's just the way I'm put together. But I, I was curious if people did. This, this was a picture painted by uh, Warner Salmon half a billion times, and it was just 1940, since 1940. It's interesting, some of you may see, have seen this next picture, but Popular Mechanics put out a picture. Uh, in criminal investigations and forensics, uh, they're able to use 3D imaging and things today to get a really good picture of what someone might have looked like, and then you combine that with DNA and genetics from family members. They can get uh, hair types and eyes and everything. It's really neat. Um, and using that same technology, scientists took a bunch of head skulls from uh, the Middle East, Jerusalem, place where Jesus would have been from those that have passed on, and they construct, constructed using the same technology what Jesus would actually have looked like 
not exactly, but very similar, uh, and then used uh, eye color and hair based on um, going back in genetics and what the, in the knowledge that they have of people at that time. And this is the image that they came up with. Have any of you seen that? I saw it on the internet a while ago, so I looked it up. That is not how I pictured Jesus, not how I picture him in my prayers. And so when I first saw that, seeing this image of him was unsettling to me. I felt, uh, I didn't feel the connection according to the image that I had had growing up and how I had imagined him. Um, any risk, I, th I think the one on the left is real similar to the picture we have in the restoration uh, based on uh, the dream. I don't, I don't remember the, the gentleman's name, uh, but he had uh, a lady painted it based on his dream. And, but when I see that, I, it's a little unsettling to me, not, not because of a different color or a different, it's just different. It is, it's not good or bad, but I'm not used to imagining Jesus in that way. I'm, I'm more have grown up with Jesus on the left. And so I don't know what it is, and if you're not stimulated by pictures or that way, it may, may not make any difference to you. But to me, it's, it's just a little unsettling. I don't know why. But as much as the physical image that we have of Jesus can move us, we, we make assumptions about people based on their looks. Uh, we do. We know that's true. Um, ask any father who has someone show up on their doorstep to date their daughter for the first time that image matters. Um, I know when I go to the financial office, David Gilmore better have a suit and tie on when he's managing my money because it makes me feel better. But uh, image, is, image matters when we think about people. But even more importantly is when we come to know people, what we believe to be true about them uh, impacts us a lot more. And that was the purpose of showing that physical image of Jesus and the difference to see if it struck any emotions or feelings within us, but to also make the point that it's very important what we think about Jesus and who he is and who he was and what he did and how that affects us today. Um, Jesus has called us to be born again spiritually. Um, I think one way of explaining what that means is understanding his great love for you, um, having that revealed to you by the Father, having it revealed to you by him in a supernatural way, that as we understand how loved we are, and, and, and everyone in this room is loved equally well by him. There is no favorites, there's no worse or better you have all been created by him and are his child, and he loves you. That revelation of that love is life-changing. And it has to come from us seeking him with, with all of our heart and constantly seeking him. And that, that experience of being born again will take place when we understand how much we're loved by him. And, and the reason that I think that's that born-again experience is by understanding that, we have the capability to love others as he's commanded us, to love in a way that he loves, and, and that's the end result of, of everything. And so how we view Jesus as he really is, um, whether we want him to be more like the Romans in, the, in that time period, and we want him to deliver us from our trials and take care of our enemies, or whether we want to be free on the inside from the, the faults that we have, the struggles that we have, the sins that we struggle with. Uh, we're probably all in different areas of that in our walk. And so today as we gather here, we, we have different images of who Jesus is, not physically, but some in here may already have had that born-again experience. You know you're loved by Jesus, and you have hope each day, and, and you can't help but manifest that love to other people 
because you see them as eternal creatures created by him. And, or some may just be indifferent and not even pursuing him and not even caring one way or the other. Uh, or maybe at a time in your life where you, you just feel lukewarm or going through the motions, but he won't leave you there forever. You'll be pushed one way or the other eventually. But regardless of where we're at, and, and, and even if we're really put off by this Jesus because of the trials we've gone through and the sufferings we've had, that he's still mighty to save you and bring you out of that. But regardless, we all, we all have an image of him. Just a few scriptures, and I'll close. They give us some images of who Jesus is. I looked and beheld the virgin again, bearing a child in her arms. And the angel said unto me, Behold the Lamb of God, yea, even the Eternal Father. Knowest thou the meaning of the tree which thy father saw? And I answered him, saying, Yea, it is the love of God which sheddeth itself abroad in the hearts of the children of men. Wherefore, it is the most desirable above all things, and the most joyous to the soul. And where, where is your belief in that image of Jesus? Do you believe he's truly the most joyous thing to your soul, or are there many other things that you get more joy from? Area of improvement to pray about and work on. He sent fiery flying serpents among them, and after they were bitten, he prepared a way that they might be healed, and the labor which they had to perform was to look. And because of the simpleness of the way or the easiness of it, there were many who perished. Now, how does that scripture fit into your image of Jesus? We've all been bitten by the serpent, as we saw in that video, and as Genesis says, we've been bitten by sin. We're under the umbrella of sin, and in, we're in a sinful world, and we have the effects of sin. But Jesus smashed the head of the serpent. And our labor, our work while we're here, is to look to him. Or as the scriptures say, behold the Lamb of God, to behold him and to keep him in our image, to keep him in the front of our mind. It seems too simple, and there's too many other things to do or to try to work on, I think, than just keeping Jesus front and center of our mind, but that's how we're healed. Romans says that by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, but even so, the righteousness of one, the free gift, came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. When we see this picture, I wonder, do we really think we're sinners, or do we judge each other next to the person next to us or on the side of the road, or do we realize how sinful we are and how badly we've been bitten and how that poison will kill us? But do we also believe that we need a Savior and that he can make us righteous, but we can't, we can't become righteous on our own. Behold, it has been made known unto me by an angel that the spirits of all men, as soon as they depart from this mortal body, yea, the spirits of all men, whether they be good or evil, are taken home to that God who gave them life. And then shall it come to pass, the spirits of those who are righteous are received into a state of happiness, which is called paradise, a state of rest, a state of peace, where they shall rest from all their troubles, from all care and sorrow. Earl, I was eavesdropping on your conversation with uh, uh, his wife. I just lost a name. <laughs> huh? Terry. Golly, getting old, man. Terry, you were talking with Terry this morning about a dream and, and, and where the country's going and... Uh, how things are looking and how, how bad they look. But there's a state of happiness, right? A state of peace, and I know you know that, that a state of rest from all our troubles, from all our care, from all our sorrows. And for those that 
going through those sorrows and troubles, that's great news. But also, there's a place for the wicked, and they have no part nor portion of the Spirit of the Lord, for behold, they chose evil works rather than good. Therefore the spirit of the devil did enter into them and take possession of their house, and these shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, and this because of their own iniquity, being led captive by the will of the devil. How does that fit into our image of Jesus? Do we have a false image that a loving God would never really do that, that that's just to kind of prod us along, or do we believe that that's the ultimate truth and that? what I do from the time I get up to go to bed each day, the choices I make and who I'm seeking and how I'm being transformed is, is important, is eternally important. And finally, from Third Nephi, First Nephi 3, a prophet would the Lord God raise up among the Jews, yea, even a Messiah, or in other words, a savior of the world. And he also spake concerning the prophets, how great a number had testified of these things concerning this Messiah of whom he had spoken, or this Redeemer of the world. Wherefore, all mankind were in a lost and in a fallen state, and ever would be, save they should rely on this Redeemer. So this morning, as we've seen physical pictures of Jesus, different images, And we've read scripture that talks about Jesus, and we've talked about the Romans and their idea of who Jesus, uh, the Jews, who this Jesus was going to be to sit on his throne and, and to deliver them, that we need to remember that we're called to be born again and changed in the inner man, to love like Jesus loves, and to understand, most importantly, to understand his love for us to have that revealed to us so that we have the power to do that, not on our own strength. I think that's how this is relevant to us today. And so this week, as we head towards Good Friday, the death of Jesus and the resurrection, uh, and we realize that his kingdom is upside down compared to our fleshly desires, think on Jesus. Think on the image that you have of him as he really is, and what you choose to believe about him, and whether or not you're open to allowing the Father in heaven to reveal to you in a greater way his love for you, so that we can be transformed into his image. As we think on and rejoice about this Jesus, let us turn to hymn 20 in the purple. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Hymn 20 in the purple. We will sing, stand for the singing of this hymn. Almighty God, as we enter this holy week, may you remove our cares and thoughts of the troubles of this world and make our focus Jesus to be witnesses of the good news and the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm. 